Welcome to the second part in our series aimed at defining the regressive left. In the first part, I made a distinction between two sorts of leftists, liberals and radicals, and argued that what we call the regressive left is basically a special case of the radical left. I described liberals as those who are fighting to constantly improve society according to the ideals of enlightenment, while accepting that the human ape isn't capable of creating a perfect and completely enlightened society. Radicals, on the other hand, are those who believe that the nature of humans is to live in an enlightened utopia, and it's only the current systems that are preventing humanity from achieving that utopia. Finally, I defined regressives as radicals who no longer claim to believe in utopia, yet are still judging the system by a utopian measuring rod and condemning it for not living up to it. In this episode, we will see how this weird new attitude manifests itself in what is the main flag of the regressive left, identity politics. To understand the dynamic of it all, we need to focus on the value that is most central to leftist thought, equality. This is one of the values of enlightenment, but for the left-wing side of enlightenment, this is the value that determines all others. You can't have freedom, justice and so forth if you don't have equality. The question is, what is equality? And here's where the difference between liberals and radicals lies. If we go back to the early days of the enlightenment movement, before the French Revolution, Western society was divided into classes of people that had different rights by law. The Enlightenment deemed this an unfair state, because humans, no matter which class they belong to, are all mostly the same, and should be treated the same. And when it comes to the differences between humans, those cannot be predetermined. Intelligent and stupid people are born in every class, so by giving preference to the higher class we are denying intelligent and skillful people of the lower classes the opportunity to be everything that they have the potential to be. So, say the liberals, you can't discriminate against people based on their birth. Everyone should be equal before the law, so everyone gets the same opportunity to realize their own potential. So this is the liberal understanding of the concept of equality, but the radical understanding of it is very different. Let's go back to the years of the French Revolution. The new constitution of 1793 gave equal rights to all French citizens, and so the Enlightenment position has won. But some revolutionaries were not content. Take, for instance, a group that called itself the Conspiracy of the Equals, which was led by Gracchus Babeuf. In 1796 they published the Manifesto of the Equals, which essentially rejected the new constitution since it didn't go far enough. The Manifesto opens by declaring that equality is the first wish of nature, the first need of man, the first bond of all legitimate association. It goes on to declare that we did not achieve true equality, and that we want real equality or death. So what is real equality, according to Babes people? The manifesto specifies, Let there no longer be any difference between people than that of age and sex. Since all have the same faculties and the same needs, let there be for them but one education, but one nourishment. They are satisfied with one sun and one air for all. Why then would the same portion and the same quality of food not suffice for each of them? So, the idea is that all humans are born exactly the same. They have the exact same faculties and needs, so they all require the exact same nourishment and education to realize their potential. If we give all of them the exact same treatment, the equality that is in their nature will manifest itself, and we will have equality of outcome. And since we can see that we do not have equality of outcome, and some people have greater faculties than others, the only explanation can be that they were not given the same treatment, which means that the system is oppressive. Where does this idea come from? Well, let's go back to one of the founding texts of enlightenment, John Locke's Second Treatise of Civil Government, originally published in 1689. In the second chapter, titled The State of Nature, Locke describes what he believes to be the natural state of humans, before they get together to form a society. He describes it as a state of equality, in which no one has more power and authority than anyone else, because it is simply obvious that creatures of the same species and status all born to all the same advantages of nature and to the use of the same abilities, should also be equal in other ways, with no one being subjected to or subordinate to anyone else, unless God, the Lord and Master of them all, were to declare clearly and explicitly his wish that some one person be raised above the others and given an undoubted right to dominion and sovereignty. So we find the same idea. All humans are born the same. In the next paragraph, he substantiates that claim by relying on the writings of Richard Hooker, a 16th century theologian, and we realize where this idea originates from. It comes from religion, from the biblical story that man was born in the image of God. And so, if all men were born in the image of God, 
That means that they are all created from the same mold and are exactly the same. The only basis to the claim that humans in nature are similar to each other, we find, is the Bible. If you believe in the Bible, as early Enlightenment thinkers like Locke still did, it makes sense. Over time, however, Western people in general and leftists in particular have lost the belief in the Bible and turned to science to learn about human nature. Today we know that we are not all created from the same mold, but each of us has their own DNA. We are more than 90% similar to each other, but we also have differences that mean that each of us has different faculties and needs. And yet, the idea that humans are equal in their nature lingers on in leftist thought, refusing to disappear. Every generation has its own version of Rakus Babef, finding something in human nature which they claim is the same in all of us. It is a superstition that is a relic of religious thought, a superstition that evidently has a great appeal to the human mind, because it has managed to enthrall many minds and subjugate them. And it is a superstition that has plagued the left since the days of the French Revolution to this very day. It is a left-wing maxim that equal rights are not enough. The goal, as we recall, is to ensure equal opportunity to everyone, and it turns out that equality before the law does not ensure it. In the century and a half following the French Revolution, the left was occupied mainly with wealth disparities, since it was obvious that the poor do not have the same opportunities as the rich. The liberal left was thus focused on achieving social reforms for the poor, and scored many important victories that narrowed the inequality of opportunity. The radical left, meanwhile, was occupied by the idea that the nature of humans is to live in a society where there's no property and everyone shares the wealth, and so it was trying to bring about a communist revolution. By the middle of the 20th century, the Western world has adopted the idea of the welfare state, so the liberals felt that there wasn't much to be done on that front anymore. While the radical left became increasingly more shallow and idiotic with its Marxist communism, the liberals have shifted their focus to a new front, identity. The idea here was that there were still some born identities which prevented people from achieving equality of opportunity. Western society was still occupied with the idea of creating an enlightened man, and that ideal produced a culture that was biased against certain groups. First of all, since the ideal was that of an enlightened man, it focused on men, and women were sidelined. An even bigger problem was blacks and homosexuals, who were perceived as the other of the ideal man. Black culture was regarded as less progressed, and the way that black people danced, moved and talked was seen as a symbol of the unenlightened past that we are trying to get away from. So if you were unfortunate enough to be born black in the West, you had the choice of either giving up on your culture and learning to behave like whites, or keeping your identity but giving up on your opportunity to advance in society. The liberal struggle from the 1960s onwards was therefore focused on changing Western society's self-perception, and opening it up to allow for women, gays and blacks to have equal opportunity. If you want to learn more on the subject, check out my video titled Identity Politics Are Obsolete, in which I describe this struggle in more detail. But another thing that I say in the video is that this period is over. The aim of these identity politics, after all, was to get beyond identity. Once we've ensured that your race, gender and sexuality don't stand in your way to have equal opportunity, we can discard identity politics and work on creating a society in which a person is not judged by the identities they were born with, but by the character and the identities they choose. That was the dream that Martin Luther King spoke of. In the beginning of this decade, it seemed like we were close to achieving that ideal, that we have both achieved the quality of opportunity and created a public discourse that has gone beyond identity. We haven't achieved the quality of outcome, but that was never the goal. It was enough that we have created a system dedicated to equality, a system that fixes itself. So the remaining disparities, for instance the fact that women don't have similar representation in government and industry, are just remains from the past that will disappear in time. There is also the possibility that this inequality of outcome will never disappear, because it might be the result of natural differences between genders and races. We don't know for sure if such natural differences exist, so we can't make definite statements either way. We can't automatically blame the system for the disparities, because they might be the result of natural differences. On the other hand, we can't just write off the disparities as a result of natural differences, but we need to continue to analyze the system and look for discriminations that should be fixed. However, evidence for such discriminations is becoming ever more scarce, so liberals started to look for other causes to fight for, and mostly we've shifted our attention back to wealth disparities, which are once again a problem after the demise of the welfare state. But that left the field open for the radical left to annex identity politics and use them for its purposes, and so, our public discourse is once again rife with talk about identity. 
What lies at the basis of radical identity politics is the same superstitious thought pattern we witness in Gracchus Babeth and his followers. But it goes even further than Babeth. While the manifesto of the equal still allowed for differences due to gender, the radical feminists of today claim that there are no natural differences between the genders, and the differences are artificially created by the system, or as they call it, the patriarchy. Once again, this idea that there are no natural differences between the genders has no legs to stand on. It is merely a superstition, which the feminists have blind faith in. The only proof that they provide for the existence of the patriarchy is the inequality of outcome between men and women, and they refuse to accept any explanations for it that are rooted in nature and history. The idea of natural equality between the genders is accepted as gospel that cannot be questioned, and if this equality isn't manifested in society, it must be because we live in a patriarchy that discriminates against women. In recent years, feminism has become intersectional, which basically means that the myth of the patriarchy has been expanded to include other identities. The radical leftists of today portray Western culture as a culture that is geared toward privileging the straight white male. They have thus created the pyramid of oppression, in which people are classified by their gender, racial or sexual identities, and are then ranked by the level in which they are being allegedly oppressed. Once they've constructed this imaginary pyramid of oppression, the radicals present themselves as the defenders of the supposedly oppressed identities, and pretend that they are carrying on the liberal fight of the previous decades. But, as I said in the opening, there is something curious about this radical left, which distinguishes it from radicals of the past, and justifies banding it with a special label. The regressive leftists are radicals who do not present a utopian vision. They don't say that equality of outcome is what they are after, they just blame Western society for being a patriarchy that oppresses certain identities. You have to follow the logic to its end to realize that the oppression that they speak of is merely inequality of outcome, and most people don't take the time to follow their logic. The casual liberals, those that I call passive regressives, thus do not recognize the switch from equality of opportunity to equality of outcome, and so they still sympathize with the regressives and perceive them as liberals, who are continuing the good fight against sexism, racism and homophobia. Thus, when the more aware liberals try to fight back, it is easy for the regressives to convince the casual liberal that they are doing so out of bigotry. This bastardization of identity politics, I will try to show, is the root of most of the evil that the regressives have brought upon our culture in recent years. Everything else is just tumors that have gone out of this cancer. The first two episodes were dedicated to lay the philosophical groundwork to understand where the regressives come from. In the next episodes, we will describe the tumors themselves, all the different phenomena that characterize the regressive left, and we will also provide examples and explain the distorted logic behind them. I expect there to be enough material for many episodes. But these identity politics are not just bad because of what goes on top of them. They are also bad in themselves. With the identity politics, the regressives have taken us back to a time when people were judged not by their character, but by the group they were born into. They have thus taken us back several centuries, back to the time before enlightenment, back to a world that we thought we have left behind. And that is why they are the regressive left.